So to look at ice sculpture is something pretty special for people. Connecting Point, tonight at 7.30 and online at NEPM.org. You're watching New England Public Media on WGBY Springfield. Those who controlled words had a certain amount of power. Please begin. Are you not excited to be returning? I rather thought we'd seen the last of you. He really was an American genius. Franklin might be his own best invention. The kids who come here are competing in a world that is very high achievement. Oh my God! Coming up, we're connecting you with the creativity and culture in your community, including a printmaker who draws on her past to make art in the present. Here I was all of a sudden with just a white piece of paper and I could do whatever I wanted on that piece of paper. A new exhibit documents the history of iconic live music performances. You captured uh, Janis Joplin and Jerry Garcia, the years in which those artists passed away. So his photographs are made sort of that much more memorable. And Art on the Rocks, the ice sculptors of Pittsfield's 10 by 10 Arts Festival. I think about what I'm going to do. We carve it, it looks great. And then if the weather changes, it's gone. Join us for those stories and more as we explore the creativity, culture, and community that make us Western New England. Up next on Connecting Point. Support for Connecting Point is provided by our contributing viewers. Welcome and thanks for joining us for Connecting Point, your source for creativity, culture and community. I'm Saidalis Bauer. Growing up in Iceland had an immense effect on Edda Sigaldar's daughter's sense of visual delight, color and form. Few trees allowed for unobstructed views of horizons, mountains, waterfalls, rivers and glaciers. And today she finds that she draws on these visual memories in her monotype prints. Her most recent show opens tomorrow at the Oxbow Gallery in East Hampton, and producer Dave Frazier visited her recently and brings us her story. It's very therapeutic because there's an air in here that is, gives me uh, creative um, vibes. Ever since I was in art college way back in the olden days, I had vowed that I wanted to go into printmaking when, you know, my work would cease a little bit and, you know, having worked really hard all my life in, um, in graphic design. But here I was all of a sudden with just a white piece of paper and I could do whatever I wanted on that piece of paper. And to me that was an interesting experience. My father's first name is Sigurdar. And daughter means daughter, so I'm the daughter of Sigurdar, so I'm Sigurdar daughter. That's how that works in Iceland. <laughs> I think a lot about weather I, when I grew up in Iceland on an island in the North Atlantic. It's very windy. So I think about that a lot. Um, and so you may or may not be able to see some of that in these prints. I do mostly monotype, which means that it's really just a one um, print, an original print that cannot be um, multiplied. Um, and everything is hand pulled from a, a printing press. And I like it because it gives me a lot of freedom to explore composition and color combination and, um, and the technical parts of um, printmaking is very, very interesting uh, to me. I'll add a little red. I use a plexiglass plate and I uh, roll the ink on the plate in the areas where I want it to go. Sometimes I just leave it the way I put it on or I might wipe into it to create some kind of um, 
texture. Then um, I'll take it to the press and roll it through. And then when it's through, I uh, pick up the paper and I see what I have. And then I decide what I'm going to do next. Sometimes in monotype, you can alter things a little bit by overprinting things. Um, so it has a lot of opportunities to, to create um, a print. I moved here because my daughter lives in Western Massachusetts. And so once I had moved here, I found this place. The people who are here are very open to sharing technical issues or, um, or they might come and say, you know, may I look at what you're doing? And, you know, it's very courteous and professional, but everyone is always very um, generous about, you know, what they're doing and how they're doing it and sometimes why they're doing it. And I feel definitely that I'm in my own world and, you know, people are just working here. There's very little, you know, just talking with each other. It's quiet and everyone is sort of doing their thing and this is my happy place. And if you love the art of printmaking, please visit our webpage for more on the process behind the art. Established in 2000, ZMA's Printmaking is a working studio where artists come to make prints in a safe environment free of hazardous toxins. In a digital extra, founding director Liz Chalfin talks about the mission of this studio that's tucked away in an old mill building in Florence, Massachusetts. Many of our members have already had some printmaking experience, but they've had to leave the field because of toxicity issues and health issues. So finding this studio has been a way for them to come back into an art form that they love and had to leave um, because we offer a safer way to do it. You can find that digital extra and so much more online right now at nepm.org slash connecting point. If you are missing the experience of concerts and live entertainment, the Springfield Museum's latest exhibit will transport you into the center of some of the most iconic performances in modern music history. Front Row Center Icons of Rock, Blues, and Soul is currently open through May 1st at the DeMore Museum of Fine Arts and features the photography of Larry Holst, who has chronicled five decades worth of concerts. I spoke with Maggie North, Curator of Art for the Springfield Museums, to learn more about the exhibition. We were really excited to bring this exhibition to Springfield, not just because the photographs are stellar examples of a unique and exciting approach to photography, but also because the show in its totality really chronicles the history of modern music in an exciting way. So this is an opportunity for um, people who love music, people who love photography to come together and to see icons of rock, blues, and soul as the exhibition title suggests. Larry Holst was born in California. Um, he joined the military and returned to that area in 1969, where he began taking photographs of concerts. It was a way to combine his two passions of photography and going to see live music. And he's had an incredible career as a photojournalist. His work has been published in major magazines like Guitar and Rolling Stone. Um, he's also been able to share his photographs through exhibitions like this one and when he was a young man he actually worked for a college newspaper and got his start as a photojournalist that way. His approach really to photography involves being a concert goer first. He loves to be in the audience and so his photographs often frame the performers from the perspective of the viewers and when we see the photographs in the gallery we have a sense of being right there with him. I read somewhere in one of the interviews that he did that I think he went at some point he was going to like 10 concerts a month, which was incredible. And as you mentioned, that perspective that he gives, like it really gives you essentially a front row seat um, to these different moments in time. Um, I think it's there's been iconic and outstanding performances that are chronicled in this exhibit. Can you talk about some of those examples that visitors can expect to see? And do you think that there's something for everyone? 
Absolutely. Visitors can expect to see images of classic rock icons like ACDC or Led Zeppelin. Um, they can also expect to see images of rock that is early pioneering rock like Chuck Berry. They can see examples of the talking heads or new wave or kind of alternative versions of rock. And so in that way, I think there really is something for everybody in this show. And of course, the exhibition also highlights the blues genre, with masters of the genre like B.B. King, Muddy Waters, and Bo Diddley, who paved the way for rock and roll music to be created and to thrive in this country. And so I think when viewers come in, they will be surprised by the incredible variety within this exhibition and the moments in which there are opportunities to reflect on concerts that you may know of or you may have heard of the artists, as well as learn about new artists. And I, I think some of these artists that are featured in this exhibit have passed away. So it's like this is the the visitor's chance to see that moment in history that won't happen again. So I think that's really neat about the exhibit as well. Larry Hulst had this incredible ability, in part because he went to so many concerts to capture musicians at high points in their career. And sometimes at the very end of their career, he captured uh, Janis Joplin and Jerry Garcia, the years in which those artists passed away. So his photographs are made sort of that much more memorable and that much more special by the particular times in which he was there, ready and waiting to photograph them. So now this exhibition features over 70 images from hosts, um, nearly 3,000 collection of black and white negatives um, that spans over five decades of rock, blues, and soul history. What have been some of your favorite images within the exhibit, and have you personally been able to connect with any of them? One of the images that I immediately connected with was a photograph of Lauren Hill that was taken in the late 1990s as she had started her solo career and was sort of catapulting to fame. Um, and I think that different generations will come to this exhibition with different elements that they're looking for and different favorite pieces within the show. Um, but I know that Lauren Hill was majorly influential in the music that I was listening to at a certain point in my life and continues to influence artists today. And we can actually see that lineage of influence throughout the exhibition. So many of these artists were looking back to artists before them. Um, and so it's exciting, I think, for our visitors to come in and choose the image that they connect with most. And this exhibition um, really features the intersection of music and photography. Um, and as you've mentioned, it transports us to these moments in time and history. Um, what is the relationship between these two art forms and how do they complement one another? Music and photography both have an ability to spark memories within us when we as viewers connect with them. I think they have the ability to capture moments and to make us think differently about a moment or a scene. Um, so many viewers when we've walked through this space have really enjoyed an element which is part of this exhibition where we have speakers available for folks to actually listen to the music when they're looking at the photograph of the art. Artists. And so that makes that an immediate connection for our visitors. And as you said, allows visitors to feel transported. This is an exhibition that brings together the power of art, the art form of photography, as well as the power of the art form of music. The photographs capture that live um, energy and emotion that is unmatched and present in live performances. And it's a feeling that many of us have not been able to experience for the past two years during this pandemic. What do you hope the impact of this exhibition will be on visitors? You're so right. Music can be such a communal experience, and I think it can be um, so, so powerful for both the musicians and the performers. And these photographs allow us to make that connection. Even if we weren't there, we're allowed to witness it and to make that connection to the performer, in part because of the virtuoso of Larry Holst as a photographer. He composes images beautifully and uses black and white in order to really frame the image and to emphasize 
is the performer. So I hope that visitors come away from this exhibit um, enjoying some nostalgia of the past, perhaps, while additionally learning about new musicians that they may not have been familiar with. And I hope that they also have an opportunity to reflect on their own best concert memories and the way in which the arts, whether it's music or it's visual art, really can bring us together and can provide us with not only a new way to look at the world, but a connection with another human being. Every week, Connecting Point explores the creativity, culture, and community that make us Western New England. But it doesn't stop there. You can find us online anytime for exclusive features and content. Ever wonder how the exhibits at museums come to be? In this week's digital exclusive, Maggie North, Curator of Art for the Springfield Museums, gives us a behind-the-scenes look at what goes into curating each exhibit and what she loves most about her job. Very often we try to make a connection with our permanent collections. Other times, however, we try to bring in something completely new that will complement what we have on view by really building on the story. And we often think about things like the season, what will the exhibition coincide with? You can find that digital exclusive online right now at nepm.org slash connecting point. The City of Pittsfield and the Barrington Stage Company recently hosted their 11th annual 10x10 Upstreet Arts Festival. This event encourages everyone to get outside and enjoy the arts, including live music, dance, theater, and a host of other fun activities. And as part of the festivities, on February 24th, just outside the Berkshire Museum, visitors got a chance to see some ice sculptors in action. Connecting Point's Brian Sullivan dropped by to observe these unique artists as they applied chisels and chainsaws to six 300-pound blocks of ice. The only thing colder than the morning air of February 24th was the special delivery being made out in front of the Berkshire Museum in Pittsfield. The contents of that delivery arrived in six rectangular packages, weighing in at 300 pounds each. But it doesn't take long for these blocks of ice to shed much of that weight as artist Robert Markey and Peter Bikina take to carving away. First, engraving the outlines of the letters for this sculpture. Next, doing the big cuts with their chainsaws and eventually fine-tuning the design with their chisels. If it seems like they've done this before, it's because they have. This is our fourth year here doing um, ice sculptures. Tonight's the opening of the 10 by 10 here in Pittsfield. It happens in the museum, so we're at a prime location for people to walk by, see what we're doing, as well as visiting the museum. And that bit of social interaction can go a long way for two artists who, in their usual settings, don't really come across too many human beings at all for hours on end. But these aren't just two random sculptors who were chosen to do this project. These are two friends collaborating on a medium and feeding off each other's artistic instincts. We met each other through art, and we're, we've been friends for... 20 years because we do Taekwondo together. We met years ago, and I think it was eight years ago, maybe in Greenfield, where I invited him to do an ice sculpture. He was starting to work on sculpture. And then um, it was a, just three or four years ago here where we were invited by Pittsfield to do a project together. It's been nice working with him and just going back and forth. It's always nice to work with another artist and get their feedback and work together. As Marky and Bikina continued to cut and chisel these ice blocks, the cold morning air became cold afternoon air with no real major uptick in temperature. And that's been an attribute that's kind of defined the winter of 2022. Not exactly the snowiest, but consistently cold. The first day of spring is really just around the corner, but here in New England, most of the time, it's just another day on the calendar. The good news for the artists is these ice sculptures will probably still be here by the time the vernal equinox rolls around. That may be a bit of an exaggeration, but with a pending snowfall and cold temperatures in the forecast, that prediction might not have been too far off the mark. We moved the date to, this, to today three times to get to today, chasing the weather patterns. And if we get by the snowstorm tomorrow, it's going to be cold for another week. So these will last for at least, at least another week, which is not what normally happens around in February with the, with the weather changes. So we're going to be happy. We'll be seeing these for at least another week here. 
The same can be said for passers-by, who seem to be fascinated as this tandem uses their power tools, hand tools, and artistic ingenuity to convert big blocks of frozen water into words and shapes. Having their work of art remain visible for an extended period, even if it means prolonged cold temperatures, seems like a worthwhile trade-off. It's always good to feel like we're doing something that gets appreciated. And um, the, in the wintertime, you know, what's there to look at when you're outside? So to look at ice sculpture is something pretty special for people. One of the most interesting pieces to it is that I think about what I'm going to do. We carve it, it looks great. And then if the weather changes, it's gone. <laughs> And for more from the ice sculptors at this year's 10 by 10 Pittsfield Upstreet Arts Festival, visit us online for a digital extra as Peter Vakina and Robert Markey talk about the tools of their trade. Chainsaw, you, you kind of follow a line, but the chisel, you have to use the right amount of pressure so you don't dig in. And you want to be at the right angle so that you're curving things around and taking off just enough that digital extra is available only at nepm.org slash connecting point. Last fall, the Community Music School of Springfield received a state budget allocation of $50,000 for their adaptive music program, a partnership with the Springfield Public Schools. The program, which serves over 500 students in 14 schools, connects music and special education to enhance and unlock the learning potential for differently abled students, as well as offer professional development training for educators. I spoke with Eileen McCaffrey, the Executive Director of the Community Music School of Springfield, as well as Mary Kay Brown, Director of Partnerships at John J. Duggan Academy in Springfield, to hear how these funds will make an impact in the program. About nine years ago, we embarked on a project called the Sonino Musica Program, which was a partnership that was uh, developed directly with the Springfield Public Schools and the Community Music School to support music education. We are happy to say that we have uh, strings programs and band programs that support the amazing work happening in the Springfield Public Schools, and now we've expanded it to Holyoke. In that regard, after working in these partnerships, what we realized was that the uh, special ed students who were participating in our programs were really benefiting from this beautiful art form. And so we decided to do a deeper dive. And fortunately, we had in our among our faculty, uh, not just music specialists, but also special ed uh, folks, and so we developed a capacity and we went to a couple of our partner programs, such as Duggan Academy and Mary Kay Brown, and asked if we could pioneer this new project called the Adaptive Music Program. We're now in 14 schools in both Springfield and Holyoke. And it's just been an amazing journey um, of really taking our amazing special ed students and giving them an opportunity to have a music program tailored, tailored specifically to their needs. What was so wonderful about it is how collaborative it was. Um, the music teachers in the district may not necessarily have the specific skills that the AMP music program um, provides. So the music teacher in the schools together with the paraprofessionals and the teachers all come together as a unit to help support the instruction for our, our young people. And to see their eyes light up when the instructor comes into the classroom, they know what to expect. They know they're going to be singing. They know they're going to be playing instruments. They know they're going to be singing about the curriculum because the instructor will figure out what it is that they're doing curricularly in the classroom and turn it into a song that they can then sing through the day when the instructor has moved on to another classroom. And also, how going remote, we didn't miss a beat. Mm -hmm. a beat. And what was beautiful about it was not only did you have the student in front of you, but you had the whole family because the parents were there sitting side by side with their children to make sure they were accessing the Zoom, accessing the curriculum. And now they got to sing along with Andy. With this funding, what, what impact will that make on this program? 
So what we've used the money for and what we will continue to use the money for is not only the classroom work that we talked about that Mary Kay is, is referring to, but we found that creating professional development opportunities, that, that question you asked about pivoting remotely, that was uh, part of what we were able to use our funding for was to have a really nice, have beautiful camera work provided by Focus Springfield and um, some of the folks from Legacy Sounds. But we're really trying to use the money to increase our own skill building. Um, also, uh, frankly, we're doing a lot of important work around um, creating um, an equity framework for culturally and historically responsive um, pedagogy as well as, frankly, just paying our teaching artists to be able to go and do more sites and provide more services on the ground. As you mentioned, Eileen, um, you serve over 500 students in 14 different schools, which is amazing. What are the hopes for the future of this program? This is a program that has really um, the scale of it could be you know, replicated much more broadly. Um, it, we're fortunate we use the funding from the STARS grants from the Mass Cultural Council to support this. But honestly, with additional funding, we could offer this far more broadly into the schools. And some of the most incredible breakthroughs have come, language breakthroughs, young people who with autism who were not speaking, but could sing, you know, yes. words are coming. It's, it just makes us all, just gives us... Yeah so much hope. And our hope is that we continue to do the work, that the work becomes even deeper and more embedded in these beautiful partnerships with our schools like Mary Kay, and that we continue to get the type of funding support that allows us to do this work um, again and again and again, and to be a national model so that other states look and say, boy, what's happening here in Springfield? We could do this as well. And, and if we can make it accessible in terms of how we're doing this, that would also be a great hope and joy for us, is to see this flourishing across the country, not just in our own community. And that does it for this edition of Connecting Point. Remember, you can always find all of the stories that you saw in this episode, as well as exclusive features, digital-only content, and so much more online anytime at nepm.org slash connecting point. And please be sure to join us again every week right here for more stories of the creativity, culture, and community that make us Western New England. I'm Said Alice Bauer. Thanks for watching and have a good night. Support for Connecting Point is provided by our contributing viewers. and sand to fall in love on the spot. Was that your experience, Miss Hayward? I am besieged by fortune hunters. I have a plan for us both to find husbands here in Sanditon. Love is not as simple as you seem to think. Why should it not be? The new season of Sanditon premieres March 20th on NEPM. Out of all the shows that I've worked on over the years, The School's Match Wits is my absolute favorite because it has a tangible impact that you can actually feel. I've seen students on the set break down and cry, shaking after winning because they realize that they've just accomplished something that they didn't think was possible. The odds were stacked against them. And uh, in that moment, they realize that with hard work and dedication to the pursuit of knowledge, anything is possible. That's a magical thing to be a part of. For generations, New England Public Media has been a trusted and treasured institution across Western New England. Your ongoing support has made a real difference in your community, ensuring that every resident has access to in-depth reporting, educational children's programming, Terrific. smart, engaging local stories, and inspiring music and drama. Love is not as simple as you seem to think. If you've received a membership reminder, please renew your commitment to NEPM or go to NEPM.org. Thank you. After the Civil War, black Southerners were no longer slaves, but they were not yet free. The sheriff could sell free black people to corporations and coal mines. 
For 80 years, thousands of blacks were forced to labor against their will. He said, if I don't go to work, he'll put me in the river down there. One of America's most shameful chapters, Slavery by Another Name. Watch Slavery by Another Name Tuesday at 7.30 on NEPM. New England Public Media, Reading Success by Fourth Grade, the Springfield City Library, and Holyoke Early Learning Initiative, and many partners, offer you 413 Families Texting Program that provides weekly suggestions for fun and educational community-based activities for young children and their families in the greater Springfield area. Opt in by texting 413 Families to 413-7676-FAM or for Spanish, text 413 Familias. New England Public Media is sponsored in part by our contributing viewers and by People's Bank. When life gets real, it helps to have a bank that's ready for real situations. People's Bank offers a variety of ways to handle banking, even from the comfort of your own home. More at bank at peoples.com slash simple. People's Bank. You're watching New England Public Media, WGBY Springfield. The American identity begins when Benjamin Franklin knit the colonies together. Franklin is endlessly interesting. Printer, scientist, revolutionary. The things that he spoke of had a certain amount of power. He really was an American genius. Ken Burns' Portrait of Benjamin Franklin premieres April 4th 